All right, geocoding and text search in PostGIS, or more like the point in Postgres, but with PostGIS. Um, so, geocoding. Geocoding is a term of art in our field. I assume most people know it, but I'm going to talk about it anyways because it's worth demystifying how terrible it is. Uh, geocoding is about converting a description of a location into geographic coordinates. Um, so by description, I mean things like this. These are all valid descriptions of locations um, at various scales um, and various levels of accuracy. If you've ever been to Canada, it's a really cool place to go to. Um, some have context enough to get down to where they actually are. Some are lacking context. 12th and Grand could be a number of places. Ontario CA could be either in California or Canada. Um, which gets me to this idea, I mean, geocoding is easy if you restrict the domain. So, so let's say I have a table of countries um, and I want to find the location for any given string. Easy peasy, right? Just search, get the centroid of the geometry from countries where the name is Canada. But wait a second, what if my data table uses a different convention? What if it's all uppercase names? But I still have to handle any input from the user. Um, so I have to really handle arbitrary case conventions. So that's no problem, I got the power of SQL for me. So what I'll do is I'll just change my query um, and I'll search the uppercase of the column name versus the uppercase of the user input and that way they'll always always match. I have to add an index now, a functional index on Opera, but that's fine. It'll be fast and I don't have to worry about case problems. Oh, except, you know, users aren't always great at the typing. Sometimes I type Canada, sometimes I type Canada. Um, how do I get around that? Well, that's not a problem. Again, I'm still in the database. It's incredibly functional. Uh, what I can do is I can do a soundex search. So I'll take a a phonetic simplification of both the names in my database and the name of the user input and use that for an initial pass. Um, I can index that functionally and get a quick fast pass and then do a Levenstein distance com comparison. So that'll give me the uh, off by one problem. So if someone types in Canada, Canada will still match because it's only off by one character. Um, but that's not the only way things can go wrong. They could also type upper Canada or they could type Ontario but mean Canada. Um, this is the easiest case, and it's not even easy. Uh, it's already pretty complex. Um, geocoding is not easy. Not easy at a software level, not easy at a data level. Um, there's this idea of reverse geocoding, which is easier. Um, reverse geocoding takes coordinates and turns them into a description. And reverse geocoding is easy, um, in that I can give you, if I give you a geographic point, you can then drop it through various layers of locations and tell you about that point. Um, really becomes difficult when it comes to the problem of definition. Like when I say this point, what do I mean? Am I talking about Canada, British Columbia, Victoria? Am I talking about 232 Montreal Street? Unit 298 in 232 Mo Montreal Street? And as you get finer and finer, the possibilities for disambiguation go up. What if the thing is between two addresses? What do you mean? What if it's on the boundary between Victoria and View Royal? What do you mean? Um, gray areas are the bane of all geocoding problems. Geocoding is hard, legitimately hard, and it's hard because the same description, or the description of the same logical location can come in so many perfectly valid forms. These all describe the same place. Um, we've got units handled differently, we've got different abbreviations, we've got the occasional misspelling, um, we've got abbreviations of directions, we've got abbreviations of typologies, we've got um, extra specification, which doesn't help, like downtown Victoria. We've got um, one of my favorite cases, which is just the case of um, sort of nested, uh, nested regional names. So, I mean, View Royal is a municipality that's part of the Victoria metro area. Um, so when you say View Royal, maybe you mean View Royal, maybe you mean Victoria, they can refer to the same thing um, quite easily because they cover the same land, just like talking about suburbs of any city. Um, so yeah, so geocoding software is hard, and the process of converting from these sort of arbitrary strings to something a little more computer happy, um, a parsed out normalized format, that's called um, address normalization, um, or it's called address parsing if you're not going to try to standardize some of the parts. This is a normalized address of that string. I've taken the S and spelled it out to south. I've taken the st and spelled it out to street. Um, and it's hard because things which have the same names can have very, very different locations. So even if you parse the damn thing, it's not necessarily going to get you there. Um, did you know that there are two Vancouver's within 500 miles of each other? Um, did you know that there are two <laughs> places that have exactly the same address in Vancouver's? And if you don't contextually know that you're talking about the one in BC or the one in Washington State, 
you could get an answer which is 500 miles different than the answer that you want. Um, so yeah, so geocoding is hard, geocoding data is hard, depending on your, the coverage of the area of interest you're working with. But you need something that covers the area of your application concern. And you need something which is up to date and complete, because if it's not complete, then there's parts of your application which will just fail, because the data will be missing. And your data needs to be standardized to match the software requirements. The expectation of the software for what's inside the data have to match. That's where you get to things like address standardization. If the software expects south fully spelled out, but your data is full of S's, if your software expects avenue fully, sp fully spelled out, but your data is full of avs, you're going to have a problem. So the, the two go together. It's very difficult to build an arbitrary geocoder. Um, you end up with a whole bunch of cranks you have to turn to match up your geocoder software to the underlying data structures. And getting the data is hard just anyways. Um, if you're going to geocode within a single city, there are some options. Um, lots of cities have open data programs, so you can get municipal parcel data. That's a good starting point, and I'll show an example of doing that in the real world. Um, census data for national agencies, depending on the country. You know, for Canada and the U.S., you can get census centerline data, which can give you some um, leverage to doing geocoding. And of course, OpenStreetMap has global coverage. Um, for regions, sometimes the states give you full regional uh, layouts, provinces, some of them do, like British Columbia, some don't, like Saskatchewan. Um, nationwide data, you're starting to run out of options. Um, now you're down, for most, uh, most countries, down to just census data or an open data set like OpenStreetMap. And worldwide, there really is only the one free option, and that's OpenStreetMap. So yeah, geocoding is really, really hard. It's hard to get data to, uh, to support it, and it's hard to get software that works really, really well against all cases against all data and gives you really, really good results. So why even bother like, doing it yourself? You probably need to geocode. It's a really useful feature. It's just something that's really difficult to do on your own. So maybe pay someone else to do it for you. Unfortunately, there are lots of people who have geocoding services and will sell you that service for a small amount of money per geocode. Um, some of them own their own data, like Google Maps. Some of them leverage open data, like OpenCage and Mapbox. Um, don't know what, what data is behind ArcGIS Online. I assume it's some mixture of stuff they bought from here and stuff they've generated themselves. Big Maps did a lot of primary data collection themselves. Um, and if you have a web service, there's nothing stopping you from addressing that web service and doing your geocoding. You can even do your geocoding inside the database. Is one of my favorite tricks. Um, there's a lovely Python library called GeoPy. It provides an abstraction layer on top of these many, many geocoding services. There's six here, but there's probably a dozen that GeoPy will abstract on top of. So it's possible to write a geocoder that can potentially read from dozens of, geo of geocoding services, but which exposes only one software front, which is really, really nice. So here's an example of doing a geocoding function in the database. Create extension PostGIS, create extension Python, PLPython. I'm going to do my geocoder in PLPython. Whoa. Didn't know I had a transition there. Um, and here's the function. Uh, half of it is Postgres boilerplate, like the stuff Joe showed you for R. Create a replace function. Here the input is text, the output is text, the language is PL Python. And then in the middle, the Python bit. So we're going to use that GeoPy extension. We're going to import the geocoders module. We're doing one that hits the nominatum geocoder. This is a geocoder which is built on top of OpenStreetMap. Um, if you use the default nominatum from this library, you hit a public API. It's rate limited, it's, so it's good for demos, bad for production. Um, specify your geolocator, send in the address, take the result, write it into text, return the text. So, I mean, functionally, it's a handful of lines, and boom, you can call it an address and get back text. I formatted this text so it actually casts directly into PostGIS uh, geometry format. So I can run a query like this, you know, select SDGeoJSON, geocode, the old house where I used to live, spits back a GeoJSON coordinate because it's gone from unparsed string to thing it sends to the web service to string it gets back from the web service to well-known text, cast the geometry, SDGeoJSON turns the geometry back into text, and that's what it looks like. So yeah, web services work, um, and some of them work exceptionally well in terms of accuracy and currency and completeness. Google is fabulous, Bing is fabulous. Um, but they do make you pay. Um, and if the numbers of things you are geocoding is large enough, the amount of money they make you pay can be a lot. 
Um, they all have terms and conditions generally that forbid you from caching. So if you have a workload where you're geocoding the same thing multiple times, they look askance at you holding the result you got last time, which is too bad because it's really an obvious strategy. And I have to say that I've done it every single time. <laughs> Why would I not cache the results? You'll never know. Um, it's slow, right? Because you gotta do a full HTTP circuit, right? You gotta make a request, response, um, you're going over text. HTTP is not the world's greatest um, network transport. Um, and, and this is probably the one more than any of the others which will cause you to need to use your, do your own sort of solution is they don't necessarily have your data in them. Like they're good in sort of this general purpose issue of I have a street address or I have a postal address, I need a point. But sometimes the things that you are geoparsing against to try to find locations are not street addresses or they are street addresses that Google doesn't have. Um, I don't know if there is a military case, but maybe there's a military case like does Google know the names of the streets inside military bases? Do they know the names of the streets inside military bases in theater, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe not, probably not. I hope they don't, actually. Um, so yeah, maybe you need to self-serve. Uh, global geocoding self-serve options, so you need to geocode across the whole world. That's really hard. Um, you can self-serve yourself, but you need data which is complete. It needs to be current, it needs to be consistent. If you're on global, it needs to be multilingual. Uh, there's really a couple software options, either Polaris or Nominatum, um, sitting on top of OpenStreetMap, usually using geonames to provide the hierarchical layer on top that gets you from country to sub-jurisdiction to sub-jurisdiction um, before you get down to the OpenStreetMap level of detail, which is usually street-level, city-level naming. Um, they work. They can be quite hard to set up. There are, all, there are lots of consultancies out there who will help you set them up. Um, because it can be quite difficult to set them up and get them to perform right, but, uh, but they do their thing. The main limitation is not knowing for your area of interest just how complete they are. So you often have to provide, do some sort of uh, verification that the results you're getting are as good as you want them to be before you fully commit to one of these things because the underlying data has to be good enough. Um, if you're not global, if you're national, then you have a few other self-serve options um, in the States. Postus, in fact, ships with a geocoder built into it, um, built on the assumption that you feed it US Census Tiger data. So you install the Postus packages, you'll find in addition to create extension Postus, one of the options you have is create extension Postus Tiger geocoder. And the limitations of the Tiger geocoder are really around um, the underlying data. So the underlying census data is complete-ish, um, it's current, Ish. You know, they do an annual refresh uh, based on the data they get from the states and counties feeding up to them. Um, but that depends on the states and counties feeding them data. The states and counties really only feel the, the heat under them to feed them new data around census cycle time. Um, it is marvelously consistent. U.S. Census data, more than anything else, that's the huge, it's incredibly consistent. It's done to a standard. It's done to a specification. You could ex at least expect everything to be consistent in it. Um, it's Compared to the days when this was first written, it's quite accurate. You know, the, the physical locations aren't bad anymore. In the old days, they were quite bad. Um, the geocoder will give you back interpolated points, and I'll tell you what that means in a second, and it's hierarchical. So just like the consistency, the hierarchical structure of the census data is excellent. So you don't actually need a second source of hierarchy like geonames. You can just use nothing but census tiger data um, and have a fully working national geocoder. That's pretty cool. Um, but the geocoding is interpolated. So on your street, there are houses, and those houses have locations, and they have roofs, they have doors you go into. When you ask for the address of, or the location of a house um, based on its address, you generally expect the location to show up, you would like the address to show up, um, close to the domicile, preferably on the domicile. Um, Tiger does not work that way. You do not have houses in Tiger. What you have is linear streets. And each linear street knows the address range it starts out on the left side and ends at on the left side, and starts out on the right side and ends at on the right side. So how do you get from that to houses? The answer is you interpolate. So 160 U Street is 60% up the left-hand side here. That, actually, that interpolation, probably not going to be too bad because I put my little red house more or less where it comes out. Uh, 145 U Street, about halfway up the right-hand side. Oh, it doesn't quite match the house. Um, this isn't so bad because these parcels are quite big, so the 
geocoded point will probably fall inside the appropriate parcel. But it would not be surprising to me to see in any given um, quality control test of linear interpolated geocoding that any given geocode could fall on the correct parcel or on the parcel to the left or on the parcel to the right. And even on a relatively well-conditioned street with nice square blocks and nice even numbering, I would not be surprised to see something come off one parcel off either way. It's, uh, it's not good enough to deliver packages. It's good enough to get you close enough that the delivery boy can look at the front and see the right number and go in, but it's not good enough to land a drone on the front lawn. So it's important to recognize that, that limitation. Um, it, can, uh, it can match addresses that don't exist in your corpus, which you can, it's either considered a good or a bad thing, depending on, on, your, uh, on your perspective. Um, so that's, in some respects, better than uh, partial address matching. So here's how to use the, the Tiger geocoder. You create extension PostGIS. You turn on the standardizer. If you're in the States, you probably want to turn on the address standardizer and load it with the US data for, uh, for how you do address standardization. This is using the US Postal Service uh, standardizing rules. Uh, to turn on the geocoder, you need to turn on fuzzy string matching. So this uses things like Levenstein matching and Soundex matching. And then finally, turn on the geocoder itself. Um, the address standardizer is flat out magic as far as I'm concerned. Um, this is the parser. So it's finding the pieces and putting them into a, into a tuple form. Pretty good. Standardizer, this is the one, uh, you have to tell it which uh, standardization rules to use. So using the US lexical rules, US gazetteer, uh, the US abbreviation rules. So it's a little more verbose, but it does a way better job of standardizing and it actually standardizes. So if you have a st, it gives you a street. If you have a s, it gives you a south. Returns, turns CA into California. It's really, a, it's really a fabulous standardizer. I would use it just separate from the geocoder for a lot of work because having standardized addresses makes your data models a million times easier to work with. Um, but yeah, but how do you feed this sucker? Um, US Census is not small. Um, it is publicly available for download and uh, great big piles of shapefiles, one shapefile per county. So 4,000 shapefiles. So not, you wouldn't want to load it manually, necessarily. In fact, you really don't want to load it manually. Um, the, uh, the loading process is frightening. Um, what you do is you call a script builder. Um, I generate a profile in my script builder for Crunchy, which is a Unix profile um, that matched my machine. Generally, you're going to have to build your own profile so that it matches the utilities on your machine, um, things like the wget command for pulling stuff off the web, the unzip command you're going to use to unzip the archives. That stuff is all configurable. Um, the defaults mostly work on Ubuntu, but aren't guaranteed to work on an arbitrary Unix system. Um, so you generate the nation script, and uh, then you generate the script for whatever country or whatever states you want to load. Um, this is what the nation script looks like. <laughs> it's awful. Um, but it's done like this so you can support both a Windows load or a Unix load. So if you generated, um, if your configuration for your platform said that you're Windows, it would generate a bat file. This one's generated a bash file. You take that output and you execute it, and it hauls down. You can see it, it's hauling down the shape file with wget, it's unzipping it, it's creating the table, it's loading the thing in, it's, it works. I'll give it that much. Um, it feels rickety, but it works. So uh, I loaded California for, uh, for Steven's demo coming up. Um, it was frightening, but it worked fine. Once you have the geocoder set up, geocoding is shockingly easy. Uh, you call the geocode function. You feed an arbitrary string. You don't have to pre-parse it, because as you saw, we have an address standardizer, which will parse it for you into the bits. So what it does is it takes your string, it standardizes it, it uses the standardized parts to match against the uh, census data, and pulls back. In this case, I've told it only give me one. The, the one there is like how many results I want back. So by saying one, I'm saying, if you find more than one thing which might match, just give me the first one. If you say a larger number, it'll give you more possible matches, if there are other possible matches. But, uh, but one isn't bad, because it restricts the amount of uh, processing time you have to do. And then uh, the result is this kind of funny thing. The addy is the uh, address, the standardized address tuple. The geom out is the geometry. It's a point. The rating is how good it thinks it is. One is the best. Bigger numbers are worse. Um, so here's a, a query which just expands the thing out. So you can expand the address. You can see that there's the standardized address. Take the geometry. You can pull off its x and y coordinates if you want to, or just use it as a post geometry, and then the rating. So geocoder works pretty good. 
Address standardization is incredibly fast, um, 10, 10 milliseconds or so. Geocoding is variable depending on how tightly the string you've put in matches the candidates in Tiger. If it matches really tightly, it's quite quick, about 100 milliseconds. Um, if it matches loosely and has to go through a whole bunch of, maybe it's this one, maybe it's this one, maybe it's this one, then it can be 500, 700 milliseconds. Um, on average, for the Santa Clara data, which we did for Steve, they ran about 160 milliseconds. So that's, uh, that's national if you're in the market for census data, if you're okay with limitations of census data and linear interpolated geocoding. Uh, regional self-serve options. Um, this is where you get into, I am a municipality or I am a county. I have my own data and I'd like to geocode against my data for my application. I would like to not have to pay every time someone types in an address. Um, so I built up a little example here. Uh, there's 496,000, 500,000, let's call it parcels in Santa Clara County. Um, they look kind of like this. You know, they got a house number, street name, street type, uh, unit number, city name, state. Um, really common geocoding problem is not taking arbitrary string and getting back coordinate. It's take partial entry from user and give me back the things which might match. So you can very quickly type in five characters and say, oh, here's the five addresses that might match. And then they just go down and pick the one that's, that's correct. So it's a user, it's user interface affordance. Um, and we can do that uh, by just building full text search columns on our data. So this example took the parcels data, add a TS, TS stands for text search, add a TS vector column, called it TS, and then populated it by taking all these address components, the house, the street, prefix, name and type, the city and the state, concatenating them into one string and stuffing them into a, two, into a TS vector. So now I've got a full text search vector sitting next to each parcel. And at the very bottom, I've added an index on that text search vector, a GIN index, a generalized inverted index. Um, so I can do very, very fast searches. And this is what a full text search looks like. Um, if I have, if I type in 800 Greenwich and I turn into TS query, um, what it does is it says, okay, <laughs> um, a good TS query for that would be I want house number 800 and street number Greenwich. And it can run that TS query against my 500,000 records and return me a candidate in six milliseconds. So it's very, 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 very quick. Um, unlike doing something primitive, like say using a like operator, you know, parcel string match. Um, this doesn't care about the order of things. It doesn't care about the casing of things. You can include some of the tokens which make up the object. You include all the tokens which make up the object and you'll still get a result back and you'll still get a result back in six milliseconds. Um, and here's the best part for doing an autocomplete, you can give it partials. So if I start, start typing in 800 space grr, get back the two objects in my 500,000 record corpus in 10 milliseconds. So things are still really, really fast and I've only had to give it the first four characters. Um, as I get more things which I'm putting in my list and the string gets longer, the quality of the match is going to start to become more important to me. Um, so I want to put the things which match well at the front of my list, the things which match less well at the bottom of my list. Um, and I can do that by using the text search ranking function. So that just takes a query and a text search vector and returns the quality of the ranking. Um, in this case, the two entries have exactly the same rank. Um, so it's not really good at sorting them. But as you get into larger things and more possibilities, it gives you the top 10 much more nicely. So, uh, so we're almost there. Um, what I want to do is, given an arbitrary string in my form field, I want to automatically return a text search string that makes sense for that input. So the input in this case is 1094. It's kind of hard to see, but I've actually got two spaces between the west and the Emma, and my cursor is still sitting there at the end of the Emma. And what I want back is this text search string. It recognizes that the 1086 is space separated from the west, so we put an and sign there. We recognize the west is space separated from the Emma, so we put an and sign there. We recognize that the cursor is floating just at the back of the string, so we haven't finished typing that one yet, so that's a partially completed token. So I want to take that input and, re and return that output. And that output is the 
text search query we're going to use. So simple procedure, trim the white off the front and the back, split the tokens on any white space, one space or multiple spaces, stick them back together again with, at, or with ampersand signs, and then finally, if the cursor is floating at the end, stick on the global match character so we can do a partial match of that last token. And I uh, wrote a little PLPGSQL function to do that, and that's what it returns. That's what the PLPGSQL function looks like. I recognize that it's really, really ugly, but it's just four nested functions doing what I said. From the inside out, trim off the white space, split the thing on any white space, stick it back together with ampersands, and finally convert the whole thing into a TS query. We would not do that in the middleware layer because that's not the kind of people we are. Steve hates functions. It would not be that much prettier in Python code because it's regular expressions. Anyways, um, yeah. <laughs> so, so now I've got that magic function, the two-ts query partial, which makes me, allows me to write this um, middleware. This is my middleware, right? The, the eight lines of SQL. That's the middleware. Um, yeah, it's awesome. And I'm pulling from the parcels table where the things match my TS query. And I'm taking the top 10. I'm ordering them by the rankings, so I'm always getting the top 10 matches. Um, yeah, oh, wait a sec. <laughs> I'm dealing with streets, um, which, because street addressing is terrible, means there's all sorts of ways to express the same damn thing. ST for street, N for north, W for west. Um, yeah, all these abbreviations. And if you do not deal with abbreviations in your text search, then if someone types in street and your data set has stu, or vice versa, if your data set has stu and someone types in street, you've got a problem because you won't match. The tokens aren't the same. Um, but text search has this wonderful capability. Let me show in here. Oh, yeah, east. So, yeah, this works fine. 800 east Greenwich. I'm starting to type 800 east Greenwich. And it, it picks it up, right, because I've typed in E. But if I typed in east, Got nothing, because East doesn't match E. They're, they're different words. They're different tokens. What can I do about that? Uh, T-Search recognizes the idea of different string things that mean the same thing. Um, it's got the idea of a synonym dictionary. And it's usually used for natural language stuff. Um, it's got the idea of stemming. So it will match oaks to oak and oak to oaks, ran to run, run to ran. Rammed to ram, rammed to rammed. Um, it figures out those things. So if you have a big text corpus and you're writing out a full text query, it'll notice these things are functionally the same and still return documents for you. For our purpose, for addresses, we're mostly concerned about synonyms, but it also has the idea of synonym dictionaries. So we can recognize that the vote is the same as a ship, that a nova might be the same as a star, um, or in our case, that avs are avenues and bulls are boulevards and boulevards are boulevards and bridges bridges and all that stuff. Abbreviations are just synonyms to the fully spelled out address term. So we can make a synonym file and add it in. Um, and I did that. Uh, so I did it as an extension. It's called a PostgreSQL uh, addressing dictionary. It's in my GitHub. Um, it's got dictionaries for French and English abbreviations. Um, if you build it and install it, then using it is as simple as typing create extension addressing dictionary, at which point the addressing dictionaries are available underneath the server, and you can just tell the TS vector functions that instead of using the simple method for parsing the strings, to use the addressing method for parsing the strings. And in particular, for our case, since we're in Santa Cruz, the English addressing. So we get, in this case, a neatly filled out um, vector that has both the abbreviations and their possible other, other, other ways of being spelled out. So you can kind of see it here. We're converting 1234 North Main Street to the tokenized version using the addressing dictionary. Not only do we get 1234, not only do we get Main, not only do we get N, but we get North, and we get Street. So now when we type in an 800 East G, instead of getting nothing, we get 800 E Greenwich because it recognized that East could be E, East of Eden. So, anyone want to see a demo? It's a really short one. No, we want more slides. Damn! Um, yeah. So this is the same story as last time. Is this the one? What am I running? There, address lookup. Yeah, yeah, this is the one. So I've got a very, very narrow 
middleware. And it takes in the things that I've typed in my form field. What do you want me to do? It's hard to see. There's so many things at the bottom. Now I don't even have it anymore. Okay, I'm going to run it because it's right here. There it is. Parcel address autocomplete. So this is that place. Uh, I can type in any address I want. And it gives me all the possibilities. These are all the things that start with 148. Uh, things one, on 148W. How, okay, here's a fun one. I got 148W mod av. So what if I type 148 West? Still matches. West, mm, oh, there's only the one of them. 148 West Mod Avenue. Um, I can look for all the things on Mod Avenue. And I like to just, you know, draw your attention to how fast it does this stuff. Uh, so there's Clara Vista Avenue, you know, the 600 block, 700 block, 800 block. Um, that's how long the queries are taking to both run and for it to send back the GeoJSON of the parcels which match inside that form field and to draw it. Um, this stuff is incredibly fast. Um, that is all the code it took. Uh, it just got that little piece of SQL. Oh, you can see the SQL being run here. And this is the SQL, like I said, generated. There's my middleware. All I'm doing is I'm getting in, where's the thing, uh, Clara 8 in this case. The query is uh, right here. So that's what I had typed into my field. And it goes back, finds all the things that match Clara 8 using the TS query partial, spits them back up, rolls them into a JSON object, sends a JSON object back, and I just stuff that right into my form field. So there you go. Quick and easy demo. How am I doing for time? How am I doing for time, Steve-O? Damn. Not too bad. <laughs> okay, so I'm not even going to tell you how it works, but I'm just going to show you. Uh, it's a gong show, yeah, it is. I'm going to show you my other demonstration. Because it's really cool. And it's based on the same principle. So if you have two million named locations in the United States, as you do. The uh, geonames.org file for the United States has about two and a half million things. Um, and you take the names of those things and you stuff them into a full text search index. It becomes possible to pull out all the things that have a certain token in them very, very quickly. Um, so a, uh, a common word in the names of things is beach. And that gets everything named beach out of the two million addresses and encodes them into JSON and sends them all the way back to the client and the client takes the time to render them as a heat map in that amount of time. And you know, for smaller things it's faster, I don't know, like the, uh, like the regional stuff like Navajo or uh, larger stuff, you know, like where do they, where do they mine coal? <laughs> in Virginia and in the Rockies. Uh, where do you find cougars? Mostly in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> uh, and in some bars. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's full text search across uh, over two million record corpus and sending all the results back as GeoJSON to be mapped for you in real time. And this is not on the Amazon 16-way cluster. This is running on the, on the MacBook Air. So that's my second demo. But it's the same basic idea. It's just less practical and way more fun. Well, actually, I think this is more practical for a lot of people scenarios here with that, where they may not have address. They don't really care so much about addresses. But I can see, right. let's say you work with a prescription drug service and you were trying to find the little closest pharmacy that might have a certain name or a certain feature in its name, like that you put into the full text field. Yeah. It'd be almost instantaneous to look it up as opposed to standing up a large, unnamed server product, trying to get all the data working quite <laughs> properly, and figuring out how to make the complex calls into it, and then actually getting back and having to show it just in their JavaScript. Right. 
Anyway, the same. The same. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I will get off the stage, and Adam will do his thing. Thank you.